All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for attending my talk. It's on next-gen documentation with AI. And this is, I believe, the first uh, talk kicking off the Tech Docs Con here at OSS. So thank you for being here today. And to start off with, just want to introduce myself. I'm working currently as a data scientist at Red Hat. I am from um, India originally, but I currently live in the US, in uh, California. So great to be here in Vienna, and I'm hoping I get to explore the city afterwards. But um, yeah, my journey so far in the tech has been through software engineering, but now currently uh, mostly in data science. And I'm lucky to be part of Red Hat and uh, been working here for about uh, five years now. So before we get started, just want to briefly go over a couple of things that I want to cover in today's talk. I want to talk a little bit about the ev evolution of documentation over, over the years, how it originated and then how it changed over time, followed by a brief introduction to generative AI and then the potential of large language models or LLMs to do some of your uh, documentation tasks and try to improve some of your software development life cycles. And then we'll look briefly into how you can implement your LLM applications, how can you evaluate them, and then finally a very small demo to kind of show you what we have done uh, in our team to implement these type of uh, machine, uh, large language model applications. And then we will wrap up with some Q&A. But before that, I want to quickly ask in the audience, just a raise of hands, how many of you all have uh, heard of large language models or have even started using them in your work? OK, great. So a lot of you. And how many of you have specifically used it for documentation? OK. Few. So that's great. So um, in this talk, we basically want to cover how you can leverage LLMs to do some of your documentation tasks. So uh, briefly, let's look quickly at how documentation has evolved over the years. Uh, it's been around for several centuries since the first technical writer, uh, who was even considered to be like a caveman drawing on cave uh, and drawing a lot of pictures and images on these type of uh, inscriptions. And it can also be traced back to ancient civilizations of Egypt and uh, Greece, where you were seen to have all these different uh, inscriptions of figures that you can see here that were kind of uh, communicating what they want to describe certain things, certain uh, processes and procedures. However, most experts would agree that the golden age or the golden period of documentation actually started with the invention of computer and the need for mass technical documentation. So the field gained a lot of traction during, uh, I think, I believe specifically during the World War II, because that was where you had a very strong need for technical uh, documents, which were describing these complex machines, complex war equipments, to have better uh, records of how these things are working. So that's kind of where the rise of technology took place to start inventing how we can create better documentation. And then post the war with, with our uh, invention of computers, the first user manual over here was created, which was, as you can see, um, a handwritten type of document to describe actually back then the Binac computer. So that's kind of like the first uh, type of technical documentation that ever came into existence. And then fast forward to today, all of our documentation is pretty much consumed on the web. It's hosted on some type of cloud platform or backed by some kind of uh, web development engines. And you have documentation not just for software, but you have documentation for pretty much everything and anything that you're consuming as a user, right? So even if you're buying clothes, you're buying food, everything has some form of documentation. And it goes without saying that as we've evolved with technology, so has our documentation. So when you're purchasing like a laptop, it's coming with very simple, very small manuals versus you're having in detail, in-depth descriptions for some of your services and um, more recently now with large language models, there's a need for strong uh, requirement to document all of these type of newer and newer and greater technology. 
So it goes without saying that um, as our technology is evolving, we also need to kind of evolve our documentation needs. So as we are speaking about the evolution of documentation and technology, I would also like to briefly point out that there's been a huge growth in the volume of data that's being produced, which goes without saying that the number of documents also are growing exponentially over time. So this is a small image that I took from a research publication, which I think the BMC Health Services had actually published, and they were conducting a research to kind of see how you can uh, foster better uh, health uh, monitoring for some uh, particular cardiovascular diseases. And as part of this research, they basically were trying to gauge the number of documents that were being collected over time because they were trying to read a lot of uh, health-related um, documents. And this graph, clearly, you can see that there was a huge exponential surge from the late 90s to the 2000s with a growth rate for the documentation approaching almost 400 to 500%. So to handle and sustain this vast share volume of documentation and also its continued expansion as we move on with time, it's also essential to enhance some of our documentation methods, making it more scalable and making it more efficient. So as we speak of evolution in technology, I think all of us here are lucky enough to witness one of the major breakthroughs or one of the biggest waves in technology, which is Gen AI or generative AI. Now, IBM defines generative AI as a set of deep learning models that can take raw data, essentially, let's say, all of Wikipedia, and try to learn to generate statistically probable outputs when you prompt that particular model. So at a high level, your generative models will encode a simplified representation of their training data and draw from it to create new work that's similar but not essentially identical to the original data. So it goes without saying that AI is not new to us. It's been with us for many years now. It's just that it's been evolving and changing as we speak. And it's basically the entire domain that we call as artificial intelligence. But what has kind of branched off of it is a particular subdomain, which we call as machine learning. So machine learning is basically focusing on creating intelligent systems. And in the recent years, it's basically looking more further into a specific type of models, which we call as deep models or deep learning models, which comprises of a complex neural network type of architecture of models. And that's what gave rise to deep learning, which again is a sub branch of machine learning. And then finally, within deep learning, there's now been a specific focus on these generative models, which basically are understanding the semantic context and based on its trained data, it's trying to predict some probable statistically similar outputs. And this is what has led rise to where we are now, which is called your large language models. So that's basically the crux now of what we are defining as generative AI. And therefore, um, just want all of you all to take uh, this away that Gen AI is basically a subset of deep learning, which is, again, a subset of machine learning, which is nothing but the subset of the entire domain of AI. So now let's look at the magic behind it all, which is the large language models. So uh, briefly to uh, describe what large language models are, they're nothing but computational models, and they're capable of generating and modeling human language. So they have the transformative ability to predict the likelihood of the next sequence of words or generate the new text based on a given input. And the most popular type of large language model that's being widely used right now is transformative models. And if most of you all have used chat, uh, chat GPT, this is what the T stands for. It's the transform, transformer capability of these models. So these transformer-based models are nothing but using a mechanism called attention, which understands the context of words in a given sentence. 
and it allows this mechanism to enable the model to focus on different parts of the text and basically that's what it's relying on to kind of generate the next most suitable output. So in, um, in a very simple example here, the system is basically trying to generate text based on its previously built data and then it's trying to break down your set of uh, inputs into what we call as tokens. So these are basically you can consider them as equivalent to like a single word is basically broken down into chunks or what is being fed as a token to these large language models. And based on those input tokens that you are providing essentially to the model and based on its entire historical data, it's going to try and find the most similar probable outcome and generate that as a next token. So let's look here. Basically, you can see that um, the input tokens are like, I like cats more than, and then the output is basically it's predicting one token, which it's saying that I like cats more than dogs. So again, small example, but breaking it down here to kind of show you that the same type of input when given to a large language model can generate different type of outputs. So in the first example, it was, I like cats more than, and then it's predicting dogs as the next token. But in another input, when you give the same sentence, but let's say you're giving it to a different model or uh, after some n number of iterations, you're feeding it to the model again, it can maybe predict something like, I like cats more than rats. So this is basically to show you that large language models are non-deterministic in nature in the sense that every time you give an input, even though it's similar, it can generate multiple outputs. Again, this goes back to the definition that we just saw that these are nothing but taking in context what it knows and what is the most statistically similar that it could predict next. So that's why there can be many other possibilities and similarities because of which we call large language models as non-deterministic in nature. And one thing about large language models, which I would like to point out, is they can also tend to what we call hallucinate. So this means that sometimes the outputs that these models give may not necessarily make sense, again, because they're being trained on this huge corpus of data. So sometimes the outputs can be a little off uh, as to what you would expect. So take it with a grain of salt that you should not really ex uh, accept everything that the model kind of is throwing at you because it will have some uh, chances of error and bias in them. So for example, let's say it gives you something like, I like cats more than spaghetti. Now, that doesn't make sense at all to us in our context, but it thinks it's similar because it's doing a context match between what it has been trained on. So that's kind of why it, it's also important to check and keep track of what these outputs are really looking like and whether they make sense to you or not. So with that, I would like to briefly touch upon context window in large language models. Why this is important is because there are different types of models that are being created. Even as of now, uh, as we are speaking, there's probably another model being created out there. So all of these models basically differ in something as what we call as a context window. So as we saw that given an input to a large language model, it tries to break it down into smaller chunks, which we call as tokens. Now, window size or context window size is basically the amount of tokens that can be fed into the model at once to generate your output. So in other words, the window of text is nothing but the amount of tokens that the model can consider when it's predicting the next word in a given sentence. Now, why do these context windows matter? The size of these context windows matter because it determines how much information the model can consider when it's making its predictions. So you could probably guess by now that the larger the context window, the better the model can be in predicting the output because you're giving it more number of inputs, more number of tokens, more number of uh, 
type of words that it can try to correlate with its training data to make a suitable prediction output for you. So larger the context window, the larger the cap capability of the large language model to generate an output that might make the most sense to us. But again, there's a trade-off between context window and computational resources because as most of you all know by now, large language models are quite huge. And in order for you to leverage the full context window of a large language model, you will need a very um, compute intensive resources to be able to tap into that feature, which means that you will require um, a significant amount of GPU power or compute power to be able to actually feed so many number of tokens at a time to the given model. So um, in, in simple words, one token could be roughly equivalent to about four characters in English. So one token could be maybe three fourth of a word and um, hundred tokens could roughly capture about 75 words in a given sentence that you're trying to uh, in give as an input to your model. Now, there are, as I mentioned, different models that exist uh, if today, which have different types of context windows. So this is a small uh, comparison between some of the models like uh, GPT-4, uh, Google's Gemini models, and you can see below there is an indication of 32K, 128K, and then 1 million. So these are nothing but the context windows that it's saying that it can take at once to give a suitable output. So as you can see, there are more and more models that are being created right now, which can take a large number of uh, input tokens at a time, claiming that they can process and give you better results uh, because they are going to expand on their context window sizes. So that's basically a very crucial part about large language models is considering the context window lengths and the tokens that it can consume at a time. Now, what exactly are large language models good at? So there are numerous use cases that exist out there today, thanks to their ability to generate human-like text. However, there are some use cases that do fairly better with large language models, and there are some that may not be doing the best um, at all times. So one good use case is information retrieval. So they can be used to improve the accuracy and relevancy of search results. They can be used in sentiment analysis. So they can determine the sentiment of a given piece of text because it's understanding the nuances of the language, the context, and, and so on. So it will help you to kind of look at the sentiment over time. They are very good at text generation tasks. So they are nothing but natural language processing models at the end of the day. So anything to do with text, they do a fairly decent job at uh, accomplishing some of these tasks. They are also recently getting better at code generation. So uh, you might have heard of certain LLMs existing out there that can help you come up with code based on a given a human-like text that you give it as an input and say, hey, can you give me a suitable code in Python for so-and-so task? So right now, there are a few models which have been trained on certain set of languages like Python, C, uh, I believe C++, but again, it's probably not going to capture all the languages uh, yet, but there are uh, a lot of models that are being uh, developed at the moment to kind of capture a large set of programming languages. And then lastly, they can just be used as any other chatbot and conversational AI, right? So any of us can just go and open a chat GPT window or a Gemini in your browser and just ask it basic generic Q&A in your day-to-day -day task. I don't know about you all, but for me, it has become like another work companion. So I always have a tab open where if I have some uh, errors or bugs that I'm trying to debug, my default used to be Stack Overflow, but now I just go to ChatGPT um, because it's basically pulling all the informations together. It may or may not always give me the right answer, but at least it's pointing me in the direction that I would like to go in terms of the code that I'm trying to solve or the errors that I'm trying to uh, figure out. So because of their wide range of use cases, they're being pretty much leveraged in all and every industry out there. So from your finance industries to very more uh, emerging is the healthcare industry because they're just 
so much of data that's being accumulated in the health industry from patient records to clinical reports. There's a vast amount of documents that could be automated using LLMs to kind of summarize a patient's record or summarize a scan. So all of these capabilities are being leveraged now in these industries. And then, of course, in technology industries, we're leveraging it for improving some operations and business processes. What I would like to focus on is the text generation task, particularly of LLMs, because they are meant to do certain uh, language creation and uh, summarization tasks. So that's what I believe is most useful at the moment. And we can leverage these um, text generation capabilities of these LLMs to enhance our documentation. So number one, you can use LLMs to basically streamline your documentation tasks. So as I mentioned, there are various types of documentation. I'll narrow it down to maybe code commenting, code explanation, automatic generation of API docs, etc. And then you can advance the current manual and error-prone documentation standards by automating some of your documentation steps, having an LLM in the loop to help you uh, free up some time for your developers to maybe focus more on doing the app development versus spending a significant amount of time coming up with documentation scripts. And finally, by introducing LLMs into our workflows and integrating them into our system, we can basically revolutionize the software development application lifecycle and think about a future where we can even have like a real time uh, help, a help assistant for documentation, whereas it automatically is getting updated based on maybe changes in your uh, product, in your uh, bug fixes, etc. So uh, that could be a capability in the future where we could automatically detect those changes and keep the documentation fresh because as most of us know, a lot of documentation gets outdated pretty quickly. So this is where we can use LLMs and um, utilize their capabilities. So now let's get into how exactly can we implement an LLM application. So there are a few main components that you need to keep in mind when you're coming up with any problem that you're trying to solve. Firstly, identify your use case. So in today's talk, I will take as an example, the use case that we're trying to do is generate code documentation. So I have, let's say, some Python um, scripts, which is like an API script, and I want to just create some documentation out of it. So that's my use case, and this could come under the text generation task of your LLM. Now, once we know the use case, we are doing a text generation type of task, we want to summarize our codes, let's select a suitable large language model. And Preferably, we want to look at an open source large language model. There are many proprietary models as well out there, but we want to select something that's a little more flexible to use. And hence, there are a number of models out there which are currently open source. And by open source, what I mean is their license is either MIT or Apache license. So you can actually verify if you go to a hugging face, which is basically like equivalent of GitHub for LLMs, you can actually look up and see what the licensing is, and you can actually check whether these are open source models or not. And they'll also usually have some kind of disclaimer in terms of they might be partially open source. So um, there's a lot of conditions that are usually mentioned in some of these models, but some examples of open source models are Mistral family of models, Mixtral family of models, there's the IBM's Granite family of models. So these are all under the either the MIT or the Apache license. So they're considered as open source. And then finally, how do we deploy this LLM application? So there are different ways that you can approach this task depending upon what your current scenario is or what your current use case is. And depending upon the approach that you choose, you will have different computational requirements. As I mentioned, these are fairly large models, so they will require some compute like GPUs to be involved. So some of the three approaches that I would like to talk about today is 
One, you can use a third party model like the OpenAI models. You can do a local deployment of an LLM on your laptops, on your machines, which will basically use the hardware on your laptops. So if you have a MacBook, they are fairly good because they have the M1 chips. So you can actually tap into a significant amount of GPUs if, if you are a Mac user. And then finally, you can also do your own on-prem solutions, basically leveraging your own IT infrastructure, depending upon what your uh, company currently supports and provides. So these are some three different ways that you can approach this, and we'll look at each of them uh, in a bit. So the first one is trying to use ChatGPT or your third-party um, OpenAI models like Gemini. So you can do this very simple by just clicking another web browser, opening a new tab, creating a session, and doing a conversational Q&A with it, right? So here, I've just given it a very simple uh, prompt here. I said, can you generate a documentation for a Python script, which is basically extracting some data from a website, and I want to pull it into an S3 object storage. So can you come up with some kind of documentation for a script that does this? And this is kind of what uh, ChatGPT gave as an output for me. You can see it gave it like some kind of a template. It said these are some requirements. These are some input libraries that you need because I said that I am doing it in Python. So it gave me some result to kind of start off with. Now, the pros of this approach is it's easy to use. It's just another web browser tab for you and there's no GPU on your end required, right? But the cons of this, which are a lot, is you cannot adjust the model parameters. So it's fixed and tuned to certain hyperparameters. I don't want to go into those details, but there are a lot of configurations that go into um, a large language model when it's being trained. So all of these are fixed when you're using the third-party um, OpenAI models like these. Data privacy is a big one because it may not be the safest to send your customer or proprietary data to these third party models because they're gonna ultimately consume them as part of their training data set. So think again if you want to kind of send this type of private data to these services. And then finally, there's a cost involved with this, right? What we call as OPEX or operational expenses. These are billed through API requests. So if, if you all have interacted with OpenAI or ChatGPT models, apart from just doing like a simple web browser, you can interact with its API endpoint. But again, you'll have to purchase certain number of credits. And I believe this is their pricing for GPT-4 model. So it's like $5 per 1 million input tokens. So as you can see, it's going to get expensive very quickly if you're trying to expand and do this for a large number of use cases that you might have. So what's another way that we can go about trying to implement an LLM? One way is to deploy it locally on your laptops, as I said. So what you can do for this is you can do download the models from Hugging Face. They have the model binaries available uh, uh, easy to download. So depending upon the size of the model, which can easily fit on your laptop, you can fairly choose a certain class of uh, models that you can download on your laptop. And then you can use certain tools like Olama is a very popular one, which is very easy to install. You just do like a pip install Olama on your laptop. And then Olama supports certain set of LLM models that you can download directly into your laptop. So like the Mistral models, the Llama models, these are readily available. And all you have to do is say Olama oh, pull, give the model ID, and it will download it locally on your uh, laptop. And then you just have to do Olama oh, run, and it will run whatever model you downloaded. And this is basically uh, opening up a, ter a terminal on my machine. And I asked it the same question that we asked ChatGPT. But now it's going to give me an output in this form because it's spitting it out to my uh, local laptop's terminal outputs. So the pros of this approach is it removes the barrier of entry for individuals who may not have access to expensive GPUs, right? So all you need is your own machine, your own laptop, and you need to basically select certain size of models that can comfortably fit on your laptop. And there are many models that do a fairly decent job, even though they are small in size, which you can start to play around with. 
And again, you have more customization here. You have more control here because you can actually go and change certain parameters of the model, which I was telling that you couldn't do in the uh, chat GPT and other Gemini models. Now, the cons again here is there is a bit of a resource constraint as well here, because as I mentioned, it's using your laptop's uh, local hardware. So depending upon how much is capable on your machines, you can only serve certain set of models. But let's say you're looking into fine tuning, you're looking to do some more complex LLM tasks. Then again, this may not be the best approach because fine tuning will require further uh, computational hardware and you'll probably have to now start moving into the next approach, which is looking at a more scalable production level way of leveraging these LLMs. So that brings us to an on-prem solution, which most um, IT companies are leveraging nowadays, which is nothing but a self-managed LLM application. So what we're doing here is based on your choice of infrastructure and based on the products and uh, platforms that you have available at your organization, you can sort of leverage that infrastructure to try and set up these LLM applications. Now, what are some uh, pros of this is, um, before I dive into that, this is basically the demo that I will be jumping into later. So um, th this is all hosted on our um, company's infrastructure, but it's basically automating some of the documentation tasks, but it's being hosted on a cloud platform uh, that I'll talk about in a bit. So the pros of this approach is you avoid vendor lock-in, right? So you're leading to potentially better performances, better customization. You have more control on the data. So data privacy is no longer a concern because it's all on your hosted infrastructure. So you're not exposing any of that private, confidential, proprietary customer data that you might want to kind of build an application out of. And Again, you also are able to have more customization capabilities. You can tweak certain parameters in this uh, LLMs to kind of do your own fine tuning, do your own application development. However, again, all of these solutions come with its own set of challenges, right? It requires some significant investment in hardware and also expertise to manage this infrastructure and maintain it over time because there will be updates to models. There will be newer context windows that we spoke about. There will be newer input tokens that you can provide. So in order to keep up with all of these updates, you also need to have the expertise to kind of maintain it and safeguard these deployments over time. Now, it seems to be a daunting task, but um, with as we're moving in this era of Gen AI, a lot of platforms are being created which help you to solve these uh, kind of applications at scale and basically give you certain capabilities to integrate them into your own uh, infrastructure. So there's a lot of work being done to kind of help uh, people who, who want to develop these at a more production level, um, enterprise level application. So looking at all three side by side, the third party LLMs through a suitable API are good enough for generic Q&As. If you are just looking for basic questions through your day-to-day -day tasks, they are perfect for that particular use case. And keep in mind that they will have some operational expenses. They will have data privacy concerns. The second approach, which is the locally hosted approach on your laptops, these are suitable for basic development and prototyping. So anybody who's looking to just step into the field of LLM to actually understand how do you build an application, you can easily do this in uh, using your laptops and tapping into some of those uh, open source models from Hugging Face and trying it out yourself for POC type of work that you can test out. And finally, the on-prem hosting, which is suitable for scalable and production-ready applications. This is in no way uh, a product uh, pitch here, but um, since I work at Red Hat, um, we leverage Red Hat OpenShift AI. So that's our chosen platform where we have deployed some of these uh, applications on our infrastructure, and we are using 
this platform to kind of scale and um, have these LLM applications deployed in production. So uh, in, in this op approach, we're able to have more control and address those data privacy concerns that we spoke about. So with that, I'll briefly go into a quick demo. So as an example, this is a certain project that um, some, one of our teams at Red Hat was working on. It's a six-store project. And within the six-store project, the team had a lot of these different Python scripts, as you can see over here. And if you go into these Python scripts, you can see there is just um, different type of classes defined with a lot of uh, functions within each class. And um, as these scripts are kind of being developed over time, they, all of them are basically um, having some kind of a similar structure of what they are trying to achieve. And they basically wanted to create some documentation out of this. And they also had some manually created documentation as well, which was good for us because we could actually test and compare how the LLMs did versus the handwritten ones that they had uh, created. So uh, these are the different Python scripts that they were leveraging. And what we went and did is this is a repository where we've kind of played around with um, the different LLMs and we've created certain codes and certain notebooks um, as to how we want to kind of deploy this and how to automate this to kind of uh, pull in those uh, Python scripts from GitHub and use an LLM to kind of generate the output. So um, this is a repository where you can also take a look at later on to kind of understand what we're doing. And this is the UI that we put together. So we're using a Streamlit application here. Streamlit is again built on top of Python and it is a very commonly used application UI for doing a lot of these LLM front-end facing uh, work because obviously a lot is going on under the hoods, but you want a simple UI to kind of showcase the capability of these applications. So let's quickly look at what we're doing over here. So here I have some API keys that I need in order to look into some of these LLM models that I have over here. Um, I'm also using OpenAI um, just to kind of compare and see what the performance is because these models claim to be far more, um, I guess, superior to some extent to some of the other models. So I'm just using it to kind of see how it's doing compared to some of the other open source models that exist. These are some IBM uh, Granite models. These are some uh, Llama models by Meta. So there's a bunch of different models. Some of them require a key. Some of them don't because we are hosting it on our own uh, infrastructure. So depending upon what type of models I'm choosing, I'll need a relevant key for that. And now on the left-hand side, you can kind of tweak all the different parameters for the models. So we learned about tokens. So here you can also play around with how many tokens you can give to the model at a time so that it can generate a suitable output. You can play around with some of the uh, temperature parameters. This is a little more technical about LLMs, but uh, just again, some configurations that you can play around with when you're trying to uh, see how the performance of the model is changing. And then finally, you need an input prompt. So this is basically the instruction that you need to come up with to give to your model. So prompt engineering is also becoming more and more relevant now because there is a certain type of instruction that these models can understand. So the better your instruction, the better your prompt, the better it can give you a good result. So we played around with a lot of prompts and finally we came up with this one which seemed to be doing the best. So the prompt is basically saying give an API documentation for a Python code provided which has certain things like classes, functions, error handling, and it also we also gave it like an example uh, structure as to what this script should look like. And then finally, uh, we gave it some sample outputs also that we expected to give. So that's also given in our prompt as well so that it can actually understand, okay, this is the format that you're looking for. So that's the entire prompt that we've given. So you can see it's fairly large, but again, we did a lot of trial and error to actually 
see that it this works and this particular instruction is actually doing well because if you gave it just a very brief prompt it did not really do a very good job of it so you had to give it examples as to this is the template this is the structure now go ahead and give me a documentation and we also added in a request saying that if you see that there is no code do not hallucinate don't give out random you know code documentation try and say that there was no code provided and that should be it so some sometimes it worked when it did not see any code it did say there was no code provided so no documentation was given but sometimes it also hallucinated so it was predicting classes and functions that didn't even exist in the script so as i said there's always some small error which is going to come and which is going to lead to a hallucination in your llms so with that let's go ahead and see what this is going to do so these are all the different scripts that i showed you in the github repo i'm just going to go ahead and select this file and here i am basically making it chunk only certain parts of the code so i am saying only generate documentation for the functions for the classes and everything else i don't want any documentation for it so once we do that we're going to uh, go ahead and run and this will take a couple of seconds for it to understand the prompt and understand what the requirement is and as i said we also had some manually written documentation that the developers had created so we are just also uh, kind of showing that as an output here to compare and see what the generated documentation was and what the actual documentation that some of these developers wrote so here because it only detected this function since i asked it only to generate it for certain functions and uh, maybe there was no class because i don't see any class being written over here it basically detected this was a function um and then it gave me some very <laughs> uh small and if not hardly helpful documentation right so as you can see you have to really kind of play around until you get a suitable result and since i said that these are non deterministic in nature if i change the prompt even slightly a little bit it might give you a whole other output so it's a lot to do with understanding what parameters work best for these llms and understanding the prompt and the instruction to really make sure that it's giving you the desired output or as close as the desired output that you would like it to have and finally we are also evaluating some of these outputs so here we're just kind of having some uh, automated metrics which are basically comparing the generated output with the manually written output we also have um, ai evaluating ai so we're using an llm to actually uh, score the output that it created and again we gave it a prompt saying uh, score based on the following parameters if it's logical helpful or if it's correct and give it a score of 1 or 0 if the condition is met give it a score of 1 else give it a score of 0 so we are also using basically dog feeding using the llm to uh, kind of evaluate itself and as you can see on all the three parameters it gave it a score of 0 which i think is fair <laughs> because uh, maybe it's not the most helpful documentation it's probably not making any logical sense so hence it gave it a score of 0 for all three so these are some ways where you can kind of check the performance of your outputs to give you a better understanding of where it's missing and what can be done further to improve the results So as I mentioned there are different ways that you can evaluate these outputs so there are some automatic metrics like root score blue scores um these are all python inbuilt metrics that basically look at the similarity between the generated output and your actual um output you can use ai to evaluate itself here you're just using um llm as a judge so you can use a prompt to give it some criteria based on which it's going to evaluate and then finally most importantly we also need a human in the loop so we need human feedback as well so there are tools like argia which is an open source tool to help you collect um human feedback or subject matter expertise uh, feedback to give them an idea that this was the input and this was the output 
uh, what do you think the score was and give it like some criteria and the subject matter expertise or in this case the developers who made those scripts can actually go and rate okay this was not that good of a document maybe this one is better and so on to understand like how close you are at getting to the documentation that you wanted so there are a lot of challenges and limitations as we saw um, accuracy and context understanding is a big one there can be biases in your generated documentation because they are heavily relying on the training data set that the model is using there are security and privacy concerns when you're handling proprietary information making sure that you're choosing the right type of LLM uh, and looking at their licensing, looking at their uh, conditions, because a lot of these models have a lot of proprietary uh, details that you need to kind of really look before you're going to actually leverage them. There is a need for expert review. So automated documentation may not fully replace domain experts just yet, because as you saw, reviewing the outputs is still highly necessary. So we still need a lot of uh, subject matter expertise and human feedback. And then there's a cost associated with all of our LLM de deployments. So depending upon the usage, depending upon APIs, there is some type of financial implication that you need to consider when you're doing some of these uh, large language model applications. So as we're kind of reaching the end of the discussion, it's clear that uh, LLMs have tremendous potential in transforming how documentation is created, maintained, and utilized from reducing the manual burden on teams to ensuring consistency, quality, we can start integrating AI into our workflows to kind of open up the possibility of streamlining a lot of these different tasks and also basically driving innovation by leveraging these Gen AI capabilities. And what I would really like to point out is having a human in the loop approach, wherein this AI and humans can work collaboratively because there is some need of human AI partnership that's involved here. As we are building more and more complex LLMs, we need to also constantly constantly evaluate and look at how these models are actually being created. So there is still a lot of need for us to continuously improve, continuously iterate, and give feedback to these LLMs that are being developed. So looking ahead, we can expect LLMs to become more and more powerful, to become more and more intuitive over time. And as I mentioned, like they're going to gain a deeper and deeper understanding of context as we keep moving forward. And with more and more domain-specific knowledge, with more and more domain-specific documents being trained on these models, the more capabilities that they will have to kind of uh, improve all of your applications and use cases. So finally, as a call to action, if you haven't already, I would encourage you all to experiment with large language models. You can start really small, doing very small, low, low risk um, automation tasks, looking at some ways that you can deploy it either locally on your laptops, try it out by looking at some model from Hugging Face. There's tons and tons of examples where you can uh, pull out resources, look at the notebooks, look at scripts to kind of run and implement this uh, pretty straightforward and then of course as you expand and as you continue to have more and more complex use cases you can start looking into fine-tuning you can start looking into using GPUs using it at scale using it at production level uh, deployments so here are some other additional resources uh, we've given previous talks which go a little more in depth about um, LLMs. So we've, we've talked about evaluation of LLMs. We've talked about how you can use uh, LLMs using Kubernetes technologies. So there are some talks that are available on YouTube if you want to kind of uh, look into this work. And then if you're interested at the GitHub uh, repo that I shared earlier, you can scan this uh, QR code to kind of see how we did the API document generation task. And yeah, finally, thank you all for listening. I hope you learned something out of this. And if you have any questions, please do ask now. <laughs>